So good evening and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Michelle Kay. I'm one of the committee members for the BCS Learning and Development Specialist Group. Um, Jenny, you are actually currently our sole attendee, so it's all for you. <laughs> um, the, uh, tonight's uh, webinar is um, the Balancing Act, uh, Walking the Tightrope of Teacher Training uh, in Computer Science Teachers in England. Um, and our guest um, webinar presenter is uh, one of our committee members, um, Dawn Hewitt. Just a, a few slides to start us off. Uh, Jenny, I can see that you've got uh, a question. Um, actually, I'm going to just unmute you. Um, so, Jenny, if you'd like to manually unmute yourself, you should be able to, to speak to us if you need to. Um, just a, 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 a couple of uh, quick things. Um, so first off, the, uh, our specialist group, um, the BCS Learning and Development Specialist Group, as you can see, is for those involved in the delivery, delivery or management of learning in IT and communications, uh, professionals and users. So we are very inclusive with whomever um, and anybody within sort of the learning sphere. Um, our SG members are specialists in a wide range from end user uh, professional skills training, IT professional skills training, uh, IT technical skills training and university education. So we're actually quite a, a varied bunch, but we're also actually quite equal between the different ones. We are now looking to organize some future events uh, so please do keep an eye on our Twitter stream and on our web page uh, and the, those future events will be announced hopefully pretty soon. So that's it from me for now. Uh, I'm now going to pass over to our uh, presenter, Dawn. So Dawn, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm just about to share my slides with you now, if you just bear with me a second. Thank you. OK, so I'm Dawn Hewitson and my um, role is to um, look after student teachers and train student teachers in the northwest of England in computer science, um, in, in computer science education. And um, it's quite a complex, it's quite a complex undertaking, really. I've I've been doing this now for just over um, just over 20 years involved in teacher education. Um, and as a, as a sort of dedicated computer science professional um, working solely with trainees, I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, I run the largest cohort of computer science trainees in um, England currently, and um, it's it's quite a balancing act, which is why I've entitled my presentation um, The Balancing Act, Walking the Track, Tightrope and How We Manage Competency. Um, so competency is quite a big issue in teacher education, as you can imagine. Um, it involves working within a number of different frameworks and, and that can cause conflicts and complexities. So hopefully this evening I'm going to introduce you to some of those um, complexities um, and and how my kind of personal interests in there have have sort of helped me to to be able to manage those uh, those complexities as well so <clears throat> these are some of the groups that I'm involved with I'm involved with quite a number of computer science um, networks this morning I had a meeting with um, CAS include which is about inclusive computing um, I've done quite a little bit of work for Python education the Raspberry Pi Foundation and I'm also a huge advocate for the Foundation for Digital Creativity uh, my main passion though is trying to encourage my teachers to link the classroom with industry so that the children are training um, they they un have an understanding of the future roles possibly that they may undertake um, as a result of, of you know taking computer science qualifications 
Um, in terms of research, I have two sort of strands to my research. I am um, a novice uh, or an early, early re researcher, a novice researcher, and my main area that I'm studying for my PhD is safeguarding. Um, I'm looking at how children, um, how how trainee teachers respond to student disclosures, but that's aside from what we're doing this evening, but I just thought I'd let you know that. I work at Edge Hill University, which is quite an interesting place because um, when you mention Edge Hill, people go Edge where, you know, they think it's up near Birmingham somewhere, but it's in the northwest of England, just on the outskirts of Liverpool, and uh, it's a fabulous little place. So just to go on, training teachers is complex. Um, you've got to work with a number of different people from a variety of different backgrounds, some of whom are still upskilling themselves. And you've got to support the whole sort of framework in upskilling and making sure that the trainee teachers are being delivered are receiving, sorry, not being delivered, receiving the best possible um, experience that they can receive from, you know, very competent and skilled um, professionals. Um, and, and that in itself is quite difficult because of a number of reasons, which I will come back to um, as the presentation unfolds. So <clears throat> frameworks within ITT, we generally work within around about six um, different frameworks and again I'll come back to those in a, in a short while um, but ultimately I'm responsible for managing the trainees exposure to those competency frameworks and even when the trainees are on placement I am responsible for measuring both the competency of the person who is looking after them and the trainee developing their competency as well and I've got to make sure that they measure themselves as well, that they reflect upon their practice. So we have a number of uh, reporting mechanisms, which hopefully I will cover today. And then I'll cover how they are graded, how their performance is graded, because again, that's a complex and can sometimes be um, a subjective process, but we have to overcome that to make sure that the grading is, is done fairly. Um, but using frameworks we we kind of try and com combine all of the different areas so that the tasks that they undertake have have signposts to various frameworks within the um within within the competency frameworks so so that's that's where i'm at at the minute and then hopefully at the end of this this webinar we're going to have a short space for some questions and answers so if you'd like to you know think about some questions you might like to ask please do you know please do ask them at the end okay so <clears throat> the framework for training teachers you can see there are broadly three pillars there's the individual um pillar which looks at the trainees personal standards how they conduct themselves and how they reflect upon their teaching experience so that that's sort of like one framework that we work within we call that kind of the code of conduct framework that we work within there's then an academic framework which kind of explores four areas it looks at um how the how the academic underpinnings influence professional practice, um, how the academic underpinnings um, <clears throat> sort of influence their understanding of pedagogy and subject knowledge, and then how how they understand assessment and planning, and then finally they have to be able to apply a framework to ethically carry out some um, some research with young people, which again can be a very difficult ethical and undertaking, uh, it can be quite a minefield. Uh, and then finally we have a collaborative framework that they work underneath where they plan um, materials and share um, and then they deliver resources and create resources that they share. Um, assessment frameworks are very interesting and an area that perhaps requires more um, exploration which really we won't have time to do this evening but that is a really um, a really controversial area of, of computer science training at the moment because you can imagine with a large group of uh, trainees there are a number of different assessment frameworks used within the settings that they are they're working in and preparing them for that can be sometimes quite a difficult task and then finally we like to get them to become exposed to shared platforms and to you know the 
other organisations who are contributing to um, the development of teacher education. So they do things like it, they're engaged in the computing at school network, they're involved in um, the, <clears throat> lots of different initiatives um, and they have to understand the frameworks for engaging in those initiatives as well, which again can be quite complex. So for me personally, I have two areas that I have to um, look at. I have to ref I have to govern myself by the HEA standards, and I also have to map the skills of the um, of the people who I'm training and how map how that training matches um, the HEA standards. And I also have to demonstrate an evidence of how I've applied those standards to an external examiner who comes in and and um, visits visits with me and talks to me about you know how to apply how I'm meeting or not meeting those standards, whichever the case may be. We also have assessment regulations for the university that we work with. Um, we have um, independent assessment rubrics that govern the whole of teacher education, but we also have internal assessment rubrics that we have to um, be, be compliant with as well to, to match with our own academic regulations and, and the university takes all different kinds of measures to ensure that we comply with those regulations um, and, and those are also assessed by the external examiner that comes in <clears throat> to visit with us. I'm very fortunate in that my examiner, my external examiner, examiner currently is responsible for all teacher education that goes on within the university is not just responsible for um, computer science so I get a double whammy um, of making sure that I'm compliant with all the rubrics that surround academic regulations. <clears throat> so starting with the trainees areas um, of accountability the teaching standards are the first area that they um, are exposed to because those are the regulations and frameworks that govern their success or failure as a competent teacher and to to help them to work towards demonstrating competency in these areas we have um, portfolios that they create whereby they reflect upon their um, their experiences um, during their teaching during their teaching practices um, and they have to demonstrate evidence of how they have responded to those teachers teaching standards and for our institution it isn't good enough for them to just have one instance where they um, where they demonstrate this competency they have to demonstrate it three times in each different setting and they also have to reflect upon um, what they've learned from from engaging with that teaching standard so it is quite um, a complex undertaking for them because it, it is a very holistic um, approach to to managing competency and at the moment effectively there are eight teaching standards but there's also a part two which is quite controversial for some of the trainees because it covers um, things like Britishness and um, professionalism and all of all of which these these things are very subjective sometimes and loosely defined so it can be very difficult um, to, to deliver that aspect of the curriculum um, and the other thing that's really important is subject knowledge acquisition. Um, the, one of the main problems with computer science training at the moment is the, the pendulum has swung very far over towards coding. And whilst that is an important part of um, of computer science there are other other areas which sometimes the trainees tend to neglect because they're focusing on learning to code all the time in a relevant language for the current practice situation they find themselves in so um, most of the schools that we work with deliver python as, as a platform <clears throat> and quite a lot of the trainees when they first come to the university they've never experienced or encountered Python so we, we train roughly um, between 35 and 50 um, trainees each year in how to use Python and it can become quite a sticking point in their training but the subject knowledge um, works on the basis of an audit 
the audit um, monitors how they've acquired their skills and how they have used those skills in the classroom. And uh, we do have an audit document, but each university has their own audit document that they use. It's personal to the process, but basically they're all assessing the same thing, the knowledge acquisition of the actual um, individual teacher. OK, so the other thing that governs the process of um, computer science teacher training is the national curriculum. And one of the problems that we have with the national curriculum is the, the brevity of the, um, of, of the actual national curriculum itself. It's very much open to interpretation. Um, and, it's, and it's also very political. It changes regardless of you know, who's in power. We have different, um, different interpretations of what should be taught in school. And currently, the, the national curriculum has these three areas. So we have the digital literacy area, which covers e-safety, privacy, wider use, um, computing, which covers programming and architecture. And then we have IT, which is about the creative and purposeful use of computing of computers and also the storage and retrieval of, um, of information within computerised systems. And so that again is another framework that we've got to make sure the trainees adhere to. And so in order to facilitate this, we make sure that they reference the national curriculum in all of their planning documentation and also where possible in their lesson delivery so that um, the the pupils that they're working with and the people who are observing them know that what they're teaching them um, actually matches the national curriculum. Um, and and it's sometimes it's it's an area that um, that does get overlooked by the trainees because they become so engrossed in the topic area that they're teaching rather than the framework. But we do always have to draw them back to the national curriculum um, and the way that that informs their training processes. OK, so these three systems work together um, to ensure that they are competent practitioners. Um, so we have the teaching standards, the Ofsted framework and the HEA standards. They're kind of linked to and they're all interlinked. Each one is really interlinked. Um, the teaching standards and Ofsted, um, we try to demonstrate to them how the teaching standards are interpreted by Ofsted by providing them with a grid or a framework that they use um, that categorizes um, <clears throat> each of the teaching standards. So, for, so you would be an incompetent teacher if you fell into these categories over on, on this side of the table. The table isn't here. And, and, uh, and we also share with them very much what excellent teaching looks like and how Ofsted interpret excellent teaching. So we kind of have a document that does that. The trainees don't tend to engage very much about HEA standards. They, they really engage with the Ofsted framework and the teaching standards framework. The HEA standards tend to govern how I operate within these two frameworks. So it's, it is very complex, but um, sort of if you imagine that the HEA standards underpin the university side of the training, the Ofsted and the teaching standards govern um, how they conduct themselves in school and the teaching, teaching standards and HEA standards govern their, their operations within the university. So this is how the teaching standards work. Um, I'm just trying to minimize that there. So we have literacy, um, the numeracy and problem solving that um, governs everything they do um, within the teaching standards. They've always got to consider the impact of those three areas on, on any materials that they may deliver in within a classroom. And then I've put pupil progression over here um, because sometimes the trainees lose sight about what we're actually about. Pupil progression, if, if the pupils don't make progress in their lessons, then they can't be deemed to be a competent teacher. <clears throat> so that always has to be a focus of, of what they're doing. And if the pupils aren't making progress, then the lesson is, is deemed to be inadequate. OK, and then we have the planning and assessment, which is kind of like the next tier down uh, that we look at. We look at how They've planned the lesson, the activities that they've designed, what framework they've used to do that, and then how they've measured the success 
of the lesson. And then the bottom kind of tier is the behaviour. Um, often, often a lot of teachers are um, put off by behaviour of young adolescents, but actually we don't tend to have too many problems with the trainees managing behaviour. Interpersonal relationships can be a difficult one um, because when they've spent three years on an undergraduate course managing um, programming tasks, often interpersonal relationships are secondary. So we have to teach them about managing professional relationships and, you know, sort of things like not adding your mentors as a friend on Facebook and not adding pupils as friends on Facebook, on Facebook attending meetings, making sure that they give due um, reverence and respect respect to the people who are looking after them when they're in the school setting um, and, and that's quite important really because a lot of the a lot of the people who look after the student teachers they are volunteers who are using are giving back to the profession they they are um, they're using goodwill you know and and so that's quite important that the trainees acknowledge that in their training and and you know that that they develop an awareness of how to work within within sort of um, structures within a school. And then finally, we come back to the subject knowledge. Obviously, they have to know about what they're delivering in the classroom, and that can be um, that that can be quite quite difficult. And then finally, we've got the the way in which the students support the scaff and scaffold the the learning of the pupils in their charge because it isn't just a case of um you know we're going to have a lesson today on um networks and everybody gets the same diet of what they're going to deliver often within the confines of a computer science classroom and um, the the pupils have varying degrees of understanding so the, the lower ability um, pupils need to have support and the higher ability, ability pupils need to have something to do whilst the lower level pupils are being supported and also be, have to be able to demonstrate that they, you know, that they have been pushed and challenged. We call it stretch and challenge, but um, that it just means how they've been pushed beyond where they were at the start of the lesson. OK, so how do we measure this? Well, we have um, we have a number of ways that we that we measure these things. The literacy, numeracy and um, lesson observations and things like that. We have we have um, a planning cycle that the trainees engage with um, and the planning cycle um, provides opportunities for them for them to demonstrate their development in literacy and numeracy. Um, we also ask them to develop problem solving skills and they have to evidence on their plans where they have used these skills and they are fed back to via the um, lesson observation process and the the academic assignment so that's how that aspect is 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 measured pupil progress is often measured via um the application of rubrics and looking at how um how they measure progression within their lessons and again different schools measure pupil progression using different um, using different rubrics so the students have to demonstrate that they can apply more than one way of measuring um, measuring pupil progress and and that's often gained by moving them between two different settings so they'll learn to apply one um, progression method in one setting and then move on to another setting um, planning teaching, well, generally before they um, they actually are observed teaching, they have to produce um, a lesson pack. And as part of that lesson pack, um, we give them feedback on that lesson pack. Um, and they also submit lesson packs for academic assignments that they that they are assessed on. Um, assessment <clears throat> is measured via a specific assignment and also via their um, classroom conduct. So, so we look at how they are measuring pupils' progress. And then finally, going on to the bottom, well, it isn't finally, we've got this one here at the side to measure. Um, the the behaviour, we, we use a, a framework called behaviour for learning, which is how the, how the trainees command behaviour within the classroom setting. Um, and, and that's governed by Ofsted processes really of what is acceptable behaviour in the classroom. 
Um, again, interpersonal relationships is a very, very difficult one to, to monitor because often you have situations whereby um, when you're working with somebody on a day-to-day -day basis and there are things that irritate the mentors about the trainees, often they call me in rather than tell them directly. Um, sometimes it's issues with personal hygiene, which requires me to give the smelly talk, which is often quite interesting. Or it may well be that they talk too much in a lesson and they will be told about this repeatedly by the mentor. Um, and, and if that they don't conform to what's what's expected, then they call me in again and I, I um, I demonstrate to the students why and give them some ideas of, um, of of what to do. And then again, the subject knowledge we look at, we measure subject knowledge um, during the uh, during the actual lesson observation process. We look at how they have interpreted um, a specific area of the curriculum and also how that has um, impacted on on the on the pupils in the class. <clears throat> So the personalised provision again, um, we look at how the pupil progresses, as you know, has it has it been conducted successfully? In have the pupils made progress? And it's up to them to include a measurement mechanism in their lessons. So we look for those kind of things. But then we also ask the trainees to reflect upon their. Um, you know their their perception of the pupil progress, and and that that is quite an important part of their development because often in the early stages of um, teaching they can't see actually how the pupils have or have not made um, progress. Okay, let's just move this slide deck on. Okay, so. The people, the trainees need to have a good understanding of what we are actually looking for, what Ofsted and what we are looking for as um, professionals. And so we've talked already about the, the role that pupil progression plays, um, but observations are very subjective sometimes. What is perceived as being good practice in one school can often be perceived as poor practice in another. Um, and that very much depends upon the uh, senior leadership team within that school. So we have a generic way of delivering um, th the frameworks of observations for teaching and learning, but then when they are on placement, they are encouraged to um, ask you know, those people who will be observing their teaching and learning for the frameworks they are using. And also they're encouraged to match them to the Ofsted frameworks as well. Um, data generation is quite an interesting one. Um, I try to frame um, lessons to them as um, a data capture exercise sometimes because actually they should be creating data for the for the school that they are working with so that they the school can be accountable for the progression of the pupils in their charge. So we ask them to use things like tracking sheets and um, get, engage with the school tracking systems to provide feedback to the senior leadership team and also to the pupils primarily about where they're, where they're moving or where the, where the pupils are going within their, um, within their particular lesson. And that again is quite an important um, part of the actual process. So the professional standards fr framework is the university um, frame, framework. And this is where we look at the core knowledge, the professional values, Gosh, there's a spelling mistake there, I do apologise. The teaching excellence framework and the areas of um, activity. Um, the teaching excellence framework is the new way of measuring, um, and I've failed miserably, I think, here with this spelling mistake, I do apologise. But um, the teaching excellence framework is the way in which we are measured as a university. Um, and we're measured towards how um, we're looking after our students. So we have a code of, as lecturers, we have a code of conduct, we have a competency within the subject, we have to design and plan our learning in the same way that student teachers plan and design their learning, and then we have to collaborate with professional networks um, like, like I am doing today. Um, I'm involved in the teaching and learning committee and I um, 
work with hopefully with the colleagues within the within the, within the committee to to contribute towards the British Computer Society teaching and learning framework. And then we look at equity of provision. Um, and that for me is quite an important area because I am actually partially sighted, which is one of the reasons why probably I've got a spelling mistake on that slide. Um, but I, I do, I am registered disabled and I encourage my students to look at how they make equitable provision for those people in their um, in in their classrooms so for example for me as a partially sighted person I would ask that that they scaffold you know they scaffold their learning by providing um, little things like um, like film clips or um, resources that support people who may have different learning needs um, and that goes under the differentiated provision um, the ITT, we ask them to collaborate in teaching networks. So we have um, locally to the university, we have our own um, national centre for um, computing excellence, and they are encouraged to participate in that in that network. Um, that they have to they have to attend at least one of those um, events. Um, over the over a term period and also where they can so where we have um, community hubs of computing we encourage them to not only go along and attend but actually to lead a session to volunteer to lead a session there um, and the other thing that we at, we look at in in terms of commonality is we ask them to look for opportunities where they can co contribute to the wider workforce so for example um, the BCS have um, an initiative with um, British Telecom called um, barefoot computing which is the upskilling of primary school teachers so the secondary school teachers engage in upskilling the primary school teachers as volunteers and um, we've talked a little bit about the professional code of conduct as the trainees have a professional code of conduct, I do as well. There are things that I am not allowed to do. Um, I, if, if there are issues, unfortunately, I, I have, well, it's not unfortunately, I have the role of being the designated safeguarding lead um, for the university that I work at. So I can operate within the safeguarding framework as well. But generally, the, the course team that I work with, that if, if there are safeguarding issues, they have to understand that they can't always deal with those. Um, they have to refer them on to to the various the various um, networks within the university and it's quite um, topical at the moment we've we've got a case in the news at the moment where a young lady has been referred to you know to safeguarding um, provision but it's been the external facilities so there's kind of like it's, it's a double-edged Thing because they have to follow up and make sure that, that the the students are getting the help and the support that they need. Okay, so the trainee journey um, is quite an interesting one. Um, we've got the on the job training and the off the job training. We've got the um, formative and summative assessments um, of the trainees. So we actually give them some, um, you know, some some sort of informal feedback and also formal feedback. During the course of the academic year, they have periodic reviews. So we tend to have four periodic reviews that they prepare for where we look at their portfolios, we look at their planning records, we look at um, the feedback that they've been given from the tutors and we look at the feedback that they've been given from their academic assignments. We look at their le the learning that they've undertaken um, during the course of the, the academic year and that can often involve um, sh talking about both their subject knowledge in conjunction with the assignment work that they they um, they have undertaken, and all all of these are sort of framed around what was the impact, what was the impact of the activity that they undertook, and and that governs their individual um, milestones. So we set them personalised targets in line with the teaching standards, but those targets 
govern their journey. So it looks at we look at the whole of this process holistically, um, where we where we actually give them give them feedback on on their own personal um, progress. And and it's really interesting. Um, towards the end of the process, we we look at we start them off at enrolment and everybody looks a little bit like a rabbit in the headlights and we move on towards where at the end of the um the end of the process where they're actually developing criticality of the process that they've just undertaken and for us as as professionals that's really quite an important part of the academic year because we then look at what we have done and how we could improve that for future trainees so we very much respond to their feedback on our processes once they've gone through the process themselves so they understand the teaching and learning process then and and they can give us some really valuable feedback that feeds back into the HEA Academy okay so off the job training what we give them is we give them um lectures we have simulated exercises and role play we encourage them to attend conferences exhibitions and and out of the learning um out of the classroom learning experiences so we look at things like going and visiting the museums in manchester we've taken trainees down to bletchley park we've taken them down to um the various conferences that, uh, that run and we also host conferences at the university. Um, simulated exercises and role play, we tend to subject them to um, what would you do if kind of scenarios. Um, we also look at um, placement training. So they may encounter new equipment or technologies um, that they perhaps haven't seen before. So we try to prepare them for that. Um, because different school, we, we, obviously as a university, we can't physically fit into a nine month period, every technology that every trainee is likely to encounter. But what we can do is provide them with strategies for how to um, deal with new equipment or technologies that they may encounter. The learning support, um, here we're looking at the learning support for the pupils not the learning support for the trainees there is a, le a learning support um, system for the trainees that they can access but we're looking at how they utilize learning support for the pupils okay and then the practical training that they undertake so how are they improving their um, their training skills um one of the things that we're encouraging them to to do is to improve their competency around programming so they use products like code grades and um different different um practical exercises that help them to develop their their subject knowledge competency but others other competencies as well um, they're always being shadowed by a mentor and they have two different mentors. One that looks at whole school practices such as um, behaviour, dealing with pupils who may have special needs. Um, and there are other areas that, that, that fall under pro the, profession, the professional uh, umbrella. But then they have somebody who looks after them who is a subject specialist and that person generally is with them um, for the majority of their day um, in school and, and they give them tips and advice on how to improve their practice but they also give them formal feedback each week so that they can they can look back at that and, and determine how um, how they're progressing. The other thing we encourage them to do is to visit people who are not supervising them. So go to other departments and look at how what successful teaching looks like in in other departments and, uh, and, and go and find the areas of outstanding practice within a school so that they can learn from other subject areas. OK, we encourage them to attend webinars and things like this. So this webinar will be shared with them probably, or they'll be encouraged to look at, at other webinars that, um, that that may be relevant to their personal training. And then we look at the time spent with the trainee um, writing assessments and assignments. So that writing kind of consolidates their, their learning because they're actually thinking about the things that they've done and placing them in an academic context. And that's, that's quite an important part of the off the job training so so that's something that we tend to look at quite uh, quite quickly um during the course of the you know the the 
PGC year. So on program activities, um, we we talk to them about being personally reflective. That's we, I can't stress to you, you know, how much we we get them to be personally reflective on their um, on their practice. We ask them to keep um, a journal which we use to to support professional discussions um, and, and the journal. They, they write their reflections on, on their progress, but also we encourage the people looking after them to, to also write a reflective um, piece of feedback for them when they're observing. Um, and, and that kind of, we, we put those two together so that they can look at how they're improving. We look at um, the trainees um, getting involved in formal qualifications, and that's quite a difficult one, really. It's it's a big challenge to us as training providers because obviously we're in the age of accountability, and um, schools are reluctant, really. That's probably the right word, reluctant, to expose the trainees to to teaching um, formally assessed groups so where they've got GCSE classes sometimes we have difficulties getting them um, getting the trainees experience of, of delivering formal qualifications so very early on in the in the teaching in the teaching experience we try to engage with the um, the awarding bodies we encourage the awarding bodies to come in and prepare the the trainees and we've just recently undertaken some training with the the trainees on the new qualifications that are going to come out in 2020 so they've all had to sign non-disclosure agreements and um, but they've all been exposed to the um the planned assessment strategies um that are going to be coming forward in in, in future years and, and that for me is quite an important part of the training process because they need to know what they're working towards um, and they need to know how to assess and how to prepare pupils for assessment as well because that's quite important. Okay so ensuring school-based programs um, allow the trainees opportunities to meet the teaching standards that can be a very difficult one because the school day is extremely busy and um, the teachers come in early in the morning and they leave some of them quite late at night and on top of that the actual measuring and meeting the teaching standards is on top of kind of the day-to-day -day, um, activities so that's something we have to keep an eye on um, and I send newsletters out to the trainees I call it the weekly nag um, and it has an area that they focus on um, each week so that they can make sure that they have coverage of all the teaching standards and get those look for those opportunities proactively to, to demonstrate that they've met the teaching standards and then um, we've got um, making sure the trainee can understand and apply um, the standards you know that they, they have to know what excellence is what 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 does good um, evidence for the teaching standards and good experiences surrounding the teaching standards mean and how do they record that in their portfolio and, and they really do need to understand what the difference is between good and excellent um, and the, you know they might not achieve excellent at the beginning but you know it's something that they work towards in the, in the end of their practice um, and one of the things that we try to do is we try to standardise our practice by bringing the mentors in, you know, and getting them to discuss with the trainees what excellence looks like in their setting. Um, and we try to to go to schools that we've where we've observed excellence ourselves, um, and, and generally bring those into into um, in, into you know into the uh, into the areas. OK, so finally, um, the trainees need to, need to be able to observe and reflect um, upon their delivery. So they reflect on how they've applied theory, research and practice. And they've got to be able to link all three of those together in order to be able to um, improve their teaching and learning. And the linking of those three things is really, really quite important. Um, because if they can't link the three things together, then they can't be reflective practitioners. And that's what the um, teaching standards is hoping to achieve. So how are they assessed? Well, 
it's the how, what and with whom. So this is kind of this diagram kind of illustrates who um, who looks at what when they're when they're undergoing training. So the placement and the placement references, the summative portfolio and, and the academic work is um, is all looked at by myself and I give the final grading decision um, as to where they are at as a trainee. But we also have um, triangulation processes which involve the school mentor, the visiting tutor and the trainee and collectively we come to an agreement on where that trainee is in relation to their the teaching standards. Um, the academic um, aspects. We have an independent external examiner who visits us frequently and we share materials with him frequently as well and what we try to do is we try to frequently exchange during the course of the academic year so we have um, a module leader for every module, um, an internal moderator and obviously a course leader. Now where I am the module leader, then somebody within the course interchanges um, the role of, you know, the, the actual module leader to, to, to look at the quality of what's being delivered. We also have external internal moderators. That sounds really complex, but it's people who are who work for the university, but maybe not necessarily in our subject area that come and look at the quality of what we're doing. OK, so there are a number of issues. First of all, there's the gender imbalance. Um, I've done quite a bit of work in this area. Um, if you come into my classroom today, you will still find that there are significantly more boys than than girls in the, in the classroom. And we are trying all kinds of things to um, address this. Um, but we, we're still we're still not making really good progress with that. Um, last year we had a good intake of um, of girls, but that was because I infiltrated a local girl guides um, organisation and pinched all the leaders and trained them to be teachers, and they're all now working in the teaching profession. But it is very very difficult to find girls who are who are um, interested in teaching computing. The quality and calibre of the candidates. Um, one of the things that we struggle with and we have struggled with um, is, is the um, calibre of the candidates that we, we um, gain. Um, because, first of all, most people don't engage with a computer science degree um, wanting to be a teacher. They usually go because they want to have um, a, a career in industry. And then as part and parcel of their university training, we have a fabulous um, computing department that gives them some experience of school early on in their computing um, in their computing training. And um, we perhaps need to explore that a little bit more as well as as a you know as maybe a research project. But that encourages the 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 undergraduate students to consider teaching as a career um, because we've got a problem with um, the salaries in industry and um, my my husband is um, is a, he hires um, our, our graduates and the salaries that he offers them are very competitive so teaching is not a compelling option for for um, computer science graduates so it, it is difficult to to kind of look at the the intake that we have the other thing that we have as well is that we have some people who like to be perpetual students and uh, and i call these burst rhetorists um the people who you know really can't be bothered to go and and um, tout their um their skills on the open market and so it's easy just to transfer from an academic course to becoming um you know a, a a teacher and removing them from the recruitment process is a difficult one and um, we need to check that we've not got out these bursary tourists that come because they get a generous very generous bursary from the bcs academy um, and that could that can be um, a problem 
we also have to assess the quality of their programming skills and again that it's very difficult to assess the quality of their programming skills in the during the course of an interview so what we've what we've done is we've introduced a subject knowledge enhancement um, course which is which is run by another member another colleague um, but what we can do during that process is we can we can deploy tools like code grades um, to check the quality of their coding and they're also encouraged to use things like coding efficiency um, and things like that and um, the subject knowledge of trainees well um, that's quite that's quite interesting because um, the kind of things that they learn in undergraduate courses are not always conducive to what's going on in school so we have to make sure that the training that the trainees are kind of retrained in educational computing and we've got lots of organizations that have helped us with this places like google and um, there's, there's quite a number of, org of organizations that have really contributed here and helped us out with with resources and also individuals as well we've got some eminent individuals that 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 contribute to forums and 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 really are generous in their sharing of resources to to help the trainees okay so that kind of concludes how we engage with with frameworks um, and i wondered if anybody had any questions so thank you don for that um, if anybody does have any questions if you'd like to use the option to put your hand up um, as as we're a, a close-knit group today happy to unmute you so that you can speak directly to dawn in fact let me just try and unmute everybody Let's see if there we go okay slowly getting there uh, so if you'd like to uh, actually unmute yourselves then you can ask Dawn questions directly we haven't had Dawn any questions throughout the session so it sounds like everybody has understood everything you said um, wonderful <laughs> have to say I'm, I'm very glad that I'm not actually a teacher it sounds like <laughs> an awful lot of hard work just it, to get to the point where you get to do even more hard work throughout the teaching year. It, it, it is, and that's the difficulty um, that, that, you know, the, the standards and the frameworks, because if it was just one framework, if it were just the teaching standards that they had to um, demonstrate evidence towards, then it would be, it would be fantastic because you could just really, you know, you could, you could just observe them and what have you, but they have to understand the academic underpinnings of what they're doing. Otherwise, they can never be proficient as a teacher. So that there's such a lot of hard work that goes into it. Um, and then once they're practicing, you know, there are new new pedagogies. Um, the Open University produced a document called Innovating Pedagogies. And, and that's, you know, every year that's updated with another series of about 12 different approaches to teaching that you can use in the classroom. So it's, it's quite a complex and involved um, undertaking to become a teacher. But, you know, every credit to them, we turn out some fantastic teachers. And, you know, we have changed the landscape of, of teacher education. And also we've changed the landscape of, of what's going on in the classroom throughout the Northwest region. And, and that's, that's something I'm incredibly proud of as, you know, as an individual. That sounds like quite an achievement. Um, nobody appears to have any questions at the moment. So I think we need to say thank you very much. Um, everybody for attending. Thank you, Dawn, for, for giving us quite a presentation. Um, and you know, good good luck with everything in the future. Um, I hope you don't need it too much. No, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank um, you. Uh, and and just say again, thank you very much for everybody for joining us. Um, this session has been recorded and we will make it available um, via a link on our website on the BCS uh, SG channel. Um, and it just remains for me to say thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you.